Hi everyone and um, thank you for joining us this afternoon for our uh, webinar. My name is Laura Roberts and I'm the IBCC's Communication Manager. Um, I'll be hosting today's webinar and moderating today's chat as well. Um, but before we get started with the session, um, please let me take you through a couple um, of housekeeping items um, before we get started properly. So just very briefly, today's running order is um, as follows. First of all, uh, IVCC's Director of Communications and Operations, Chris Larkin, who you can see on the screen here, will be sharing some opening remarks. After that, we'll hear from our speakers, who today are um, Alan Ayres, uh, Laurie Flanagan from DSLRS and Jeff Mo. And I will invite them now to introduce themselves. Um, Jeff. Sure, I'm Jeffrey Mo at Duke University. Uh, I've been on the Duke faculty for 21 years. I'm one of the three faculty here that proposed the voucher incentive in 2006. In 2008, the Food and Drug Administration launched the Priority Review Voucher Program following our proposed incentive. I'm grateful to IVCC for today's webinar and to the many vector control stakeholders who supported expanding the voucher concept to soon become EPA's Vector Expedited Review Voucher Program. Great, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Laurie, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience now, please? Sure, Laurie Flanagan, I'm Executive Vice President at DCLRS. Uh, I've been focusing on pesticide legislation and regulation for um, about 25 to 30 years and been involved in conversations around PREA, uh, the authorization and implementation of PREA since its inception in 2004. I work as a consultant for IVCC and had been involved in some of the conversations at the legislative and regulatory levels around VERV um, going into the final um, PREA 5 law that was passed. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. And finally, Alan, would you introduce yourself to the audience, please? Yes. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Alan Ayers. Uh, I was in the pesticide industry with Bayer Crop Science and predecessor companies for 34 plus years. I retired in 2019 and joined IBCC as senior technical advisor. Thanks for those introductions, everyone. Um, we hope that uh, following the presentation today, um, you'll have a, a better understanding of what the verb is, what its legislative framework is, and how the regulatory program might be implemented. Um, and a few other housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, we welcome questions throughout this session, so please do type your questions in the chat. Um, you should be able to see a little chat box that allows you to add your questions there, and I'll monitor the chat throughout the, the presentation and bring questions to the attention of our speakers at the appropriate times. Uh, we will interrupt the session. We want it to be as interactive as possible. However, if there are some questions that remain unanswered, we will allocate some time for Q&A right at the end of the session as well, but we encourage the session to be as interactive as possible. Also a reminder to everyone that today's webinar is being recorded so that we can distribute it amongst you after the session is uh, finished so you have it for your records. So by participating in the session you are consenting to being part of the recording so anything that is said in the chat will be captured um, as part of that recording. Um, if you have any issues with that please do write to me directly following the invitation link that was sent to you for the webinar. Um, and so now, without any further ado, I think I'll hand over to Chris to get us started in today's session. Thank you. Thanks, Laura, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And thank you very much for, for joining us on this uh, webinar. Um, my name is Chris Larkin. I'm a Director of Communications and Operations at IVCC. I've been with IVCC for just over seven years, and I've spent um, all of that time uh, in part working on the, the VERB project and helping to work to bring it towards um, its position where it is today. So um, thank you very much for joining. Um, so IVCC, we, we are, for those that don't know, we, we work with stakeholders to facilitate the development of novel, active, novel and improved public health insecticides and formulations to combat the rapidly growing problem of insecticide resistance. To prevent insect, insect-borne disease and address growing insecticide resistance, novel and improved public health insecticides, formulations and products are, are urgently needed. 
We are all aware of, for example, in malaria, how the, the 600,000 deaths are still being uh, recorded every year, and this figure has plateaued. So the urgency for innovation uh, couldn't be stronger. But keeping obviously the private sector engaged in the discovery and development of new technologies to combat malaria and NTDs is essential. However, due to the high development costs, the risks of market failure, the time to bring these new products to market, incentives are very limited. So the expedited review, expedited review voucher is a program owned by the EPA, which creates a new incentive for manufacturers to develop novel insecticides for public health. The signing of the vector expedited review voucher into US law in December, 19, in December 2022 was a major step forward for vector borne disease control. Today's presentation will detail the, the legislative mandate for Verve, EPA's approach to implementing the program, and opportunities for stakeholders to engage with the agency. So, our presentation will cover the following topics uh, this afternoon or this morning. What is a verb and why it's important? What does the law actually require the EPA and the registrant to do? How to qualify for a voucher? How to sell or use the voucher? What the EPA reporting requirements are? And what potential future changes of verb could happen in the future? Uh, we'll also talk about the verb's path towards implementation and what we have learned from our discussions and, and, and meetings with the EPA to date. And therefore, at the end, we'll also be able to hopefully pick up some outstanding questions uh, from you, but also potentially take these outstanding questions back to the EPA, either through ourselves or very much we would encourage you to engage directly with the EPA. So at that point, I'm going to hand over to Jeff Mo. Thank you. Um, so just very quickly, you can see over here the two articles, just the front pages. So, so what Verve attempts to do is to reward a registrant of a new public health insecticide with a voucher so that a second product can be uh, brought to market more quickly. And it's that speed to market which creates value. There are no sacrifices in safety requirements. Uh, the whole voucher concept, as we proposed it way back in 2006, was that speed to market is what creates, generates value, um, and it, it does so it, without creating a lot of burden and a lot of costs on society and the government. Um, and the, the most important thing is what we're trying to encourage or incentivize is that we have new chemistries that overcome resistance and that we're keeping ahead of resistance. We're, we like to say innovating faster than resistance. So as Chris alluded to, um, Congress passed and the president signed into law on December 29th, a big massive spending bill for the federal government. Part of that reauthorized PREA, the Pesticide Registration Improvement Act for five years. And as part of the reauthorization of PREA, there was money from EPA, from, excuse me, from registrant paid maintenance fees that directs EPA to establish and administer a vector expedited review program. So $500,000 per year from the registrant paid maintenance fees, the fees that registrants pay to support the continued registration of pesticide products will be used to implement this program. And under the law, EPA must implement the program within one year of President Biden signing the bill into law or by December 29th, 2023. So with that, I will turn it over to Chris for the next slide. Chris, Chris I think you're muted. Thank you. So we strongly believe that VERB is a real innovation which will help save many lives. We're aware that over 80% of the world's population is at risk from insect-borne disease like malaria, dengue fever and Zika. And insect-borne diseases impacts not just people's lives and that it also affects their, their, their health security, poverty rates, labour productivity, education and even gender equality. And likewise in the US we need to protect our citizens and our troops abroad from emerging mosquito-borne diseases. 
And we know that the most efficacious and cost effective approach to tackling these, these diseases is prevention using vector control tools. You'll be aware, many of you, of the seminal study back in 2015, where uh, Bart et al. published a paper in, in Nature which estimated that over 78% uh, um, of malaria cases were adverted through the use of vector control interventions. So we firmly believe that we must continue to in innovate and develop novel pu public health insecticides to address insecticide resistance issues with existing and future products to reach our goal of disease eradication. Next slide, please. So we are also very aware that there are significant challenges for many, many stakeholders in bringing innovation to market. And actually part of the reason why IVCC was established was to help organizations overcome some of these barriers. As a PDP, this is the space we work in. But we recognize these challenges are significant. It is a small and unpredictable market. There are very high costs of entry and the margins are very slim. There are significant regulatory hurdles and the risks are high in terms of getting their product right through the product development pipeline and it can be slow to market. But we believe the vector, the, the vector control, the vector expedited review voucher is a real incentive. It will expedite review is available because it will increase the speed to market of a second chemistry, as Jeff explained, and will act as an incentive to invest in new novel insecticides for insect insect-borne diseases. Awarding a verve gives an innovative company an opportunity to generate a financial return on another product. And Jeff will go into more detail about how, what that could look like based on his experience with Priority Review Voucher. Next slide. So here are pictures of three articles. And so the history that, that I briefly mentioned in my introduction is this. In 2006, we published an article in Health Affairs. We had done about four years of work before that time, uh, bringing the idea to various uh, assemblies of primarily economists to say, what are the flaws in this? How might this work? And so on. We were fortunate that the U.S. Congress was already kind of primed uh, to say we want to do something in the, in the global space. Uh, and so the priority review voucher was passed into law in 2007. Just like we're seeing now, the FDA was given a year to develop guidance, which they did by 2008. Uh, and I can report to you that to date, 60 vouchers have been awarded. Um, 13 of them are for neglected tropical diseases, which was the original proposal. And then there have been two uh, changes or additions to eligibility since then, rare pediatric disorders and then medical countermeasures. And those now account for the, for the other vouchers that have been awarded. So there's a very steady flow of vouchers being um, awarded as uh, sponsors bring them to the FDA for approval. We then wrote this paper in 2017, which modeled itself after the PRV to say we should think about doing this in the um, vector control space. We made some estimates, which I'll talk about later in terms of what the value might be. And then we published a paper again in Health Affairs Forefront right after the legislation was passed, just arguing what what are some things that we can expect and and we would certainly direct those of you who are interested to look at that that article it's it's free it's available um on the um health affairs forefront site next slide please laura so just so we can be clear and and what i've got is on the top line here i've got in green and then this gold this is the way that verve works and then below we've got how prv works and it'll help us just understand the mechanism and see a few differences so for verve eligibility and we have another slide and one of the other presenters will talk more about the eligibility requirement so one, it's a mechanism or mode of action that's not already been registered with EPA. It controls insecticide resistant mosquitoes, and it, it also is a vector of certain diseases that are that are carried by mosquitoes. So it's a vector uh, borne disease and it can be used in products like insecticide treated nets or indoor residual spraying. So what's the requirement? One, to complete and provide to the um, agency uh, a data package. 
At the time, there also was a, a global access plan, which I'll say more about uh, following another slide, and then an attestation that it's been it's no not been longer than two years that it was registered with another stringent regulatory authority. Well, what do you get as a reward for that? You get this voucher, which you then have some choices to make, and I'll I'll show that on a, on a next slide. You can see that this is very similar to the PRV eligibility and then the review. There are two differences there, which I'll say more about. And again, you you win this ticket, if you will, or this voucher to if you choose to to exercise on, on another product. Next slide, please. So once you have that voucher, whether it's a, a verb and a vector expedited review voucher or a PRV, your first choice is do I want to keep it? And do I want to exercise it on a second product or do I want to sell it? So we, there's a very robust market for selling vouchers in the PRV world because it's been out there longer. Uh, vouchers have, have varied in terms of the, the price and the value of them. And what really is driving the value is the number of vouchers, so the supply of vouchers. And we've seen in the early days when the voucher program didn't have many and there weren't these uh, additional eligibilities, uh, vouchers could be worth as much as $350 million in terms of publicly disclosed prices. We'll see, and, and I've, I'll show you in another slide what we estimate the value of a, a verb might be. Well, then if you decide I'm going to exercise the voucher, what that means is I've got a second product that I want to bring to the market, but I want to bring it faster. Um, and that you've got to you do the usual things, which is to bring it to the agency with the dossier. You've got to pay what the PREA category uh, user fee is. You pay that fee, and then what you achieve is faster market entry. And we we know we know that that's valuable, and we we make some estimates of that. Next slide, please. So you can use or sell the voucher, and and in the legislation it says that it's one that you can you can exercise it on a second chemistry it's not limited to to insecticides that can be any product with for registration to the to the EPA the second is that you can sell the voucher and there's no limitation on the number of times that you could sell it so a voucher could be one and then that registrant might choose to sell it the one who purchased it might then in turn want to sell it again there's no limitation on that and to exercise a voucher to say, I now have a second product I want to bring, you've got to give the, the EPA 90 days of notification to say, in 90 days, I'm going to bring this to you. I'm going to do it by exercising the voucher. And this gives the EPA the ability to understand what the demands are going to be and that it's got coming into its queue, its um, regulatory review queue, uh, a new product that needs. Um, that needs uh, the expedited review. So under the law, VERV is intended to incentivize the development of new insecticides to control and prevent the spread of vector-borne diseases uh, by decreasing the decision review time on that second product once you exercise the voucher. And in the law, it specifies that for the next five years, the focus of the program is to incentivize the development of insecticides to control and prevent the spread of mosquitoes carrying disease. Next slide, please. And I'll turn to um, So under the eligibility requirements to successfully get that voucher, you first have to register an insecticide, a mosquito control product that meets several criteria. One, it shows that there's a proven insect eff efficacy against pyrethroid or other insecticide resistant mosquitoes. It must have a novel or unique mode of action that differs from other insecticides that are already registered on the market. This is really targeting new products that get at insecticide resistant mosquitoes. It must target mosquitoes that do carry diseases like malaria, and it has to be effective in primary malaria vector control areas such as treated bed nights or indoor residual sprays. Um, and finally, of course, the product has to meet all the EPA requirements for registration, showing that it has no 
harmful impacts on human health or the environment and no unreasonable adverse effects on human health or the environment. And then finally, the new product must broaden the adoption of IPM strategies and or make IPM more effective. Basically, the goal of the product that it, you are registering to get the voucher is to have a product that really adds more tools to the toolbox to address insect resistance. On the next slide, I will turn to Alan. Thanks, Lori. Uh, those, uh, that's a summation of the eligibility requirements. Uh, we do have more details listed on there and they can be found. We'll provide that information to you. Uh, uh, but one thing that I wanted to point out, in addition to what Laurie just said, there's an, there's an exception here. Uh, and there's some, some specifics here that we just wanted to go through. Uh, I think it's been mentioned the product uh, that you uh, submit must not contain any pesticide registered by the EPA as the date of enactment, enactment which will be this December 2023. Uh, and, and Jeff already alluded to about the attestation uh, by the registrant that if you come with a, a molecule that you've already registered in another country, that as long as it's within a two year period, you can submit that to the EPA and they will look at it and move forward uh, as appropriate. Uh, but one of the major exceptions here too that was pointed out in the verb uh, provision is uh, if the administrator determines there is a significant public health benefit, an active ingredient that is registered for say agricultural use that is repurposed and submitted for control of mosquitoes and, and meets the requirements of, of what is listed in the verb uh, provision. Uh, and, and determined necessary by the administrator that there is a significant public health benefit. This compound shall be considered a mosquito control product meeting the criteria. So if it meets all of these things, then the EPA may deem this appropriate and uh, uh, grant it the voucher award. So I'll turn, let's say back over to uh, Jeff, I think. Sure. Uh, one of the things that is unique in the VERV legislation is the requirement of a global access plan. And the global access plan says it's going to be made publicly available, this information, uh, what are going to be manufacturing locations, including any licensed third party manufacturers, uh, a distribution and procurement process for, for vector control programs in the selected countries where it's going to be available, and prices for common quantities. Um, the product must be made accessible in the United States, including territories or possessions of the U.S. and, and countries where mosquito-borne diseases such as malaria are prevalent. Now, one important feature here is that the EPA is not evaluating the Global Access Plan and it's not monitoring it. Um, I've published an article in the Financial Times where I've made the argument that I think it's better for the public, those of us, to do the monitoring and evaluation of those plans and hold that registrant accountable for this. This was uh, the res the global access plan feature was added directly uh, as a result of feedback that we got from stakeholders who had believed that the priority review voucher program lacked this, that this was a, a gap and that it needed to be filled. And, and, and I'm delighted to see that that we we have this gap filled um, in the in the verb program. I think Laurie, it's back to you. Um, before we move on to the next slide, we've had a very pertinent question actually in the chat related to some of the topics we've just touched upon. So I wanted to bring it to the speakers now. Um, uh, someone in the chat is asking that, um, how does a registration in the US um, with the EPA help to deal with the diseases in the in endemic countries? How is that relevant? It's a two part question, actually, so I'll take uh, answers to that first part of the question and I'll um, let you know what the second half of the question is after. Sure, I can jump in, Laura, and just say that um, while a lot of the goal of this product is in, in countries where malaria is present, uh, we do have U.S. military bases overseas and U.S. travelers overseas in those countries. So there, there is an interest there in terms of 
uh, use on U.S. bases overseas. Uh, I, I might add a comment too. You know, just as is working for a company uh, like Bayer, if you know we can develop this, uh, uh, if if a company can develop a molecule for the public health and get this uh, voucher, uh, you know, companies can work with other countries and register those globally. So there there is a connection there. Um, you know, a, a company may go, okay, we want to do this uh, to provide it to a country in Africa, Southeast Asia, wherever, because we need to. And now we have a registration in the US. Some of the discussions with the global authorities, uh, WHO or the countries themselves, uh, they may move forward. So maybe that's an indirect way of saying that there might be an incentive uh, for spreading this, uh, these uh, new tools out elsewhere besides the US. Yeah, what I would add from our PRV experience is, what you're asking the agency, the US based agency, is to have a global perspective. And that's what happened when the priority review voucher program was added to FDA's remit. It does not expedite or make faster um, an approval in another country. They have their own regulatory regime. But what it does acknowledge is that access to the US market of a second product can be valuable, and there's the incentive. We've also had discussions with both um, uh, both agencies, FDA and EPA, about the desirability of harmonization. In other words, the practices for regulatory approval are harmonized or made more common among different agencies. There's no requirement in the law that requires harmonization, but it's certainly something that's desirable. And then reciprocity. Uh, in an ideal world, there would be um, an approval somewhere else is accepted by another that will never become mandated because each agency each government has to have its own independent regulatory authority but we would all like to see more expedited practices that allowed uh, uh, an approval somewhere the data the requirements to be acknowledged by another but that's not in the law it's aspirational um, and so we're, 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 we'll continue to, to hope for, for more harmonization and more reciprocity going forward. Thanks for those answers. And uh, something I hope, uh, Laurie, you may be able to clarify quite quickly is um, whether once registration is granted by the EPA, does the product actually need to be made available in the US market, even though there may not be a significant market for that product in the US? Well, that is one of the criteria of the vouchers that it is um, made accessible for use in the, in the United States. Obviously, a registrant is going to make their own decision about whether or not to pursue a U.S. registration and, and ask for this voucher. Thank you, Laurie. Um, there's a few other questions in the chat. One which I think we'll be, we'll save for in a couple of slides because I think we'll come to it. Um, but in the meantime, uh, an important one about um, the option to resell a voucher multiple times. Um, the point being that if uh, a voucher can be sold or resold an infinite number of times, then what process is there to prevent it to become a floating voucher essentially? So um, a voucher that then doesn't really get, sex get exercised at all. Well, I'll comment there. I mean, um, if one buys it, 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 it's either an option value that I might think I want to use it and then my opportunity you know doesn't materialize so then I want to sell it to someone else I mean at some point um, somebody's going to decide that they want to use it or otherwise the option value is going to go <laughs> go down um, so I, I'm not sure I understand it sounds like a theoretical question is it is it theoretically possible that a voucher could be sold multiple times and never be used yes is it likely no yeah, there, there's no man mandate to sunset a time no, period. No, no, it can be sold multiple times, and there's, there's, there's. It's not as if it, it, it has a, a, a sunset date that it's no longer going to be usable. Oh, that's right. 
And before we move on to the last slide, an important point to clarify, I think uh, in the chat, the question um, comes up that perhaps it seems that the verb is biased towards platforms that are specifically for the indoor control of mosquitoes, such as bed nets and IRS. And um, the point being made is that when we look at the disease goals, for, then does verb really take into account or does it allow for other different products that might uh, operate in different platforms, such as larvicides and space sprays? Yeah, so, I, 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 Laurie, you can go first if you want. Oh, I was going to say that while the goal is to have those products that can get at those really proven um, tools that work in developing countries, there is also a requirement we'll talk about on the law that EPA um, take recommendations and assess the future of the program. Should it be expanded? Should the requirements be changed? So there's certainly um, an opportunity to have to broaden what verve means as well under the law. Yeah, the other the other thing, Laurie, is that in, in provision, these are used as examples such as nets and indoor residual sprays. But if they have these compounds coming in here, EPA may say, well, we need for nets and indoor residual sprays, but we also need it for things in the territories, et cetera. So it, it doesn't go on and on and list all the interventions. Great, yeah, thank I you for that. Oh, sorry. I think the I other comment that may be appropriate is to say that what we experienced with PRV is initially it was limited to neglected tropical diseases. That was the incentive, it was targeting those. And then after about four years of experience, it was expanded to include rare pediatric disorders. And so similarly, the legislation requires that this narrow target that we current have, what's going to be incentivized, but then the agency is required, and there's a slide going to come up, to evaluate the program and perhaps make some recommendations for it being broadened or it might make eligible other kinds of uh, targets. So I think what we're, what we're seeing is, well, here's what the current legislation, it's fairly narrow. Here's what we're trying to demonstrate is that it can work. And then after that experience of five years, when the next reauthorization happens, then there might be changes. There, there's going to be an invitation to discuss and, and perhaps change the eligibility criteria. Great, thank you for that, Jeff. Um, I propose we carry on with the presentation. Um, there is one question waiting in the chat, but I'll raise it at the end because it's much more generic and not specific to the slides that we have so far. So, um, Laurie, I think I'll hand over to you for the next slide. Thank you, Laura. So what, as Jeff explained, when you register, successfully register a new mosquito control product that meets all the requirements of the law, then you get this voucher that you can use uh, or sell for an expedited review of any other product. And the law focuses really on conventional registrations, mainly because the conversations and the technical assistance from EPA during the drafting of PREA was to keep it as a narrow program to, and then later expand it so that there's more learnings. And the registration review uh, criteria for the conventional products is a lot longer. So a time off of a registration is really most valuable for those conventional products. But for different codes, PREA codes, when you register your product under a certain code, it would give you a reduced amount of time. So six months off of these specific codes for registration. So, or two months or four months, depending on what the action is that you're going to register that second product, the voucher product on. Um, and I will turn it to Jeff to talk a little bit about the next slide. Which is unfortunately a busy slide, so I apologize. What you, what you see there on the left are the same categories that you saw on the previous slide that, that Lori was explaining. Um, and in the first two columns, what it's trying to say is if the, the uh, decision date was 24 months, what do we mean by expedited? How much shorter is it? And then in the next column on the top there, you'll see 18 months. So there's the, the six months less. 
Well, then it goes down each one of those. In other words, here's what the current uh, decision date target was 18 months, 21 months, 16 months, 20 and 14. I'm reading down that left column of numbers and then moving to the adjacent column, you'll see that they're shorter by six months or um, four months or two months. And so then you could ask the question, well, if it's six months quicker, what's that worth to me? And so one way to estimate the value is to use a kind of discounted cash flows approach, which is what we've done. And then to say the size of the market, are you talking about your second product coming into a $100 million market or a $200 million market or a $400 million market? And if you use some typical assumptions of discounted cash flows, then you can say, well, if I got there six months quicker and it's a $400 million market, what might that be worth? So if you look at that top right number, you see $153 million. So that's just using discounted cash flows, typical assumptions. This is a, a table that's from the 2017 paper. It would argue that getting there six months quicker for this second product, we would estimate using that kind of method is $153 million of value. If you look at the very, uh, you look in the middle column down at the very bottom, it's a $100 million product and you're only getting there two months quicker. So 14 months becomes 12 months to the decision date. Well, that's only worth $12 million. So you can see there's a wide range depending on how much quicker you're talking about and what the size of the market is. I can say this from our priority review voucher experience. We estimated that the value of a voucher would be roughly $322 million in those markets. Talking about if a, if a voucher, a priority review voucher were cashed in on a top tier product. There were many things different in that period in 2006. The most notable being that there weren't many vouchers that had been awarded. And so at the peak of the market, if you will, a voucher was sold and, and this was publicly disclosed for about $350 million. So our estimate based on discounted cash flows of 322 and the value that was actually paid for a voucher of 350 was about what we expected. The voucher value has gone down since then in, in the priority review uh, voucher market. Why is that? Because there are more eligible vouchers. As I said at the beginning, 60 vouchers have been awarded because we've expanded the eligibility criteria. So if there's more supply of vouchers, then the demand or the cost of them goes down. So one of the things we'll be curious to see as vector expedited review voucher becomes a reality, we have a voucher or two awarded. Does it get exercised by the registrant or does it get sold? And that's going to start telling us what the value is in terms of a market value. These estimates here, as I said, are just using discounted cash flows, but it's a guide. It's a help to let us uh, appreciate what might be the value of getting to market quicker for that second product. Before we move on to reporting requirements, I think an important point to interject here from the chat is a question around given the status of the EPA's current performance on PREA actions, the agency has not really demonstrated the ability to complete a major action in an expedited time frame. So what can we say to that um, given the slide that you've just presented? Sure, well, so I'll open yeah. and to Jeff. Um, PREA 5 is intended to make the process better and more predictable and decrease the delays in registration timeframes. Uh, that will take time, but even in a, a broken thing, time off to get something quicker through the process is better. I'll turn to Jeff to talk a little bit about some of the economics of if there are delays in the registration process. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 truly, truly unfortunate that that EPA has has been missing deadlines. But one, the hope is and, and, and ironically or 
I'm not sure I want to say ironically, but just the, the agency demonstrated during uh, COVID that they were able to expedite things. I mean, there were a number of products that moved through quickly. So one of the things that we know is the number of products that are going to be submitted. We've done an analysis uh, at IVCC. The number of products that fit this criteria is very small. So over the five-year period, we, we think we'll be fortunate to see three to five products that actually qualify using these criteria. There could be more, but, but just thinking about it, I mean, IVCC has been about this business at looking at portfolios of products for a long time. It's a small number of products that will possibly be brought to the agency as qualifying for the voucher. So that means there aren't that many vouchers that would require or uh, make this request for expedited review. So we're talking, we're not talking about 10 products or 100 products. We're talking about one a year, maybe two over the five-year period or three. So I think the burden on the agency is really rather small in terms of can you achieve this? Um, we know from the legislation that these targets of making it either six months less or four months less or two months less, they're just that, they're targets. But we all know that we're going to be watching. There's high expectation that we want EPA to, to be able to do this. And uh, so, so, so our expectation is, although historically they've not demonstrated this ability, they did show it in COVID. And because the numbers are so small, I think there's reasons to be optimistic that they'll be able to achieve this. But that remains to be seen. Yeah, I would, I would make an additional comment too that part of the strategy on uh, by the industry, the Priya Coalition together to improve these registration timelines was to get more resources for the EPA. And as you saw, uh, Laurie and team on the uh, Priya Coalition, they were able to get a, a sizable increase for the agency to hire new people and to do their uh, registration programs. And such is the reason why it was good that we were able to get the $500,000 set aside uh, each year for the next five years so that the EPA can do whatever, hire a couple of FTEs or, or how they see how to use that money to take care of Verve and these other things as well. And in our discussions with Ed Messina, and this, this is no new news to a lot of people on the call, that they are hiring additional people. Uh, they have to maybe hire hundreds. They're starting out something like 40 FTEs right now so we we see this as Lori said it's it's kind of a slow process but uh let's see if this uh, uh works as they move forward thanks everyone um <clears throat> uh jeff do you want to continue with e verb reporting requirements please i think this is Lori's slide but i'm happy to Lori, do you want to present it sure either way um basically priya does require epa um, starting in fiscal year 25, because the first year the program would be implemented would be for um, 2024, to report annually on how many submissions we're seeking a voucher, the review time for each submission. We want to be able to track and, and show the value that there is the expedited review happening, the number of the vouchers awarded, how many have been redeemed, and then the decision times. What We want to track and make sure that EPA is actually meeting those targets of giving the reduced time and registration, but the, the reporting requirements will help us track the implementation of the, this provision of the law. Next slide, please. And then the law also specifies some future changes to VERV beginning in fiscal 2028, which would be a reauthorization of another PREA law. EPA should look at the program and to determine if there's any changes should be made to the voucher eligibility criteria or if additional vectors should be included in the program, um, prioritizing those vectors that include the most significant um, health risks. And there is some precedent in the priority review voucher that focused initially on neglect neglected tropical diseases and later the program out also added rare pediatric diseases. So there is a, pri a a precedent in the sister program to potentially add new vectors. Um, and in making those determinations and looking at future changes to VERV, EPA is instructed to solicit input from registrants, NGOs, 
um, government agencies and others involved in vector and disease mitigation. Next slide, please. And just we want to pass along what we've heard from EPA in some meetings that IVCC has had with the agency on the agency's plan. OPP is intending to put out guidance document that will implement the program by the end of the calendar year. IVCC will continue to request and, and meet with EPA to provide our input and input from all of our stakeholders and all of you on the call um, to the agency as the agency develops this program and what operating guidance would look like for this program. Uh, we are also exploring an IVCC Duke Global Health workshop to dig further into this when we have more information from the agency. Right now, what we understand is that EPA has spent considerable time talking to FDA about how the priority review voucher works and some of the mechanisms there as it's looking at what guidance would implement this program by the end of the year. And if you could go to the next slide, please, Laura. <clears throat> so as next path steps forward, IVC will continue to engage with EPA, all of you on the call, as EPA works to establish this program, will continue to serve as a resource to the agency and also continue to share with EPA lessons learned from FDA's priority review voucher program and uh, some of the pitfalls and what worked well and what didn't um, as that program was implemented. And we're lucky that, that Dr. Mo has so much experience to share with the agency on that front. And Laura, then if you want to um, turn back over to you and Chris to answer any additional questions. That's right. Um, we now open the floor to <clears throat> any additional questions that um, you haven't put in the chat yet, but that you'd like to put to our speakers today. Um, as people do that, I'll put forward the question that I mentioned earlier on in the presentation um, that had come through that was um, more generic and not specific to our slides, but it was regarding how many agricultural products not currently being used for vector control are being currently repurposed to fit um, a verve kind of criteria. Um, do we have any sense of a percentage of new novel novels that uh, might be that might come from existing ag products? Not other Alan. than not other than yeah. what uh, Jeff said we had done in our analysis with industry partners. There could be other molecules out there that we don't know about. Uh, there are several companies that uh, you know, may look at their, their portfolio and come with uh, additional molecules. We don't know that. And um, so that is why I think uh, it was Lori who said earlier, call and talk to the EPA uh, about this program and you have some questions, ask them directly. Uh, you can certainly pass them on to us as you've done today and we'll make it known too. But uh, yeah, that's that's still to be determined. Great, thank you. There are initially no other questions appearing in the chat. So Chris, perhaps you want to start uh, closing the session, but if any um, additional questions do come up in the chat, I'll interject um, as we do have a little bit more time. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, so it's, it's been a, a long process to, to bring the verb into law. Um, we, we know that there are many unanswered questions uh, that still need to be uh, have answers to and we would uh, actively encourage you to engage directly with the APA um, to seek that guidance. They are in the formation stage. Uh, they, they have a, a proposed eligibility criteria, um, but that eligibility criteria um, could change. And this is why it's important that they they seek input from a, a wide range of, of stakeholders. So um, we we in our in our sort of planning for, for Verve over the many years, we've been extremely encouraged by the the the, the PRV program. We, we see that as a as as uh, having a significant impact, um, and uh, we think that there are many lessons and parallels that can be drawn across from PRV to support and incentivize the introduction of, of new modes of action for those diseases that we described earlier. 
So, as I say, we'd encourage you to uh, in contact with the EPA and raise any questions that you may have directly. I, and but as as Laurie said, um, please feel free to feed them through us, and we are looking to uh, have some regular uh, meetings with the EPA as it moves towards the uh, December the 29th, 2023 uh, deadline, which is when they are uh, by law required to have set up the EPA programme. Chris, before you move on, a very pertinent question has just popped in the chat. Laurie, I think this one is perfect for you. Um, and it's asking whether the EPA has appointed a person that is going to manage the VERB programme at the OPP. Yes, um, Susan Jennings within the Office of Pesticide Programs is the point person. She is the public health advisor for the Office of Pesticide Programs and would be the right person to um, direct any comments or, or thoughts to you as she will be the point person in drafting what we understand will be a guidance document. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, no more questions in the chat. Uh, Chris, did you want to add anything else? No, I'll hand it back to you. Fabulous. Well, uh, in that case, oh, an additional question. So let me just. Uh, right, let me just skip back to slide number nine as that question relates to how um, a product wins a voucher. So, um, it's indicated that the EPA will com uh, complete a review of the data package for eligibility analysis of the verb. Um, so by which aspects do you, do we know by which aspects they review the data package and when do they consider it complete? Um, is it the one that they've already reviewed or is there another one that they review? Um, and uh, also what does this, the question is what do they do with this review? But perhaps um, what is the outcome of the review, I suppose? So maybe we can give a little bit more clarity on that. I don't know, Laura, do you want to uh, make a comment or you, you want me to comment on this? Sure, so I mean, I think that the, the basic criteria and then turn back to you and and, Jeff is the voucher is for a second product. You have the vector control product and when that's successfully registered then you get the voucher for the second product that can be a, um, any other product in a registrant's portfolio. I think sometimes um, there's there's the misconception that that the expedited review is for the vector control product. It's not. It's for a second product that could have a more profitable um, margin for the registrant and I'll see Alan if, if you or Jeff want to jump in beyond that. Well, I, the only thing that I was going to say is that uh, the EPA is going to go through and look at the types of different registrations they have and you have one for technical, you have one for manufacturing, you have one for product and you have to go through the process there. Is the technical already registered? Is that review done? Uh, does it cover the new product formulation? Uh, I think many on the on the phone know this process uh, um, much better than uh, than I do. But EPA has to go through that and see what the intent and the interpretation uh, would be. Uh, we do know and talk to the EPA that uh, if if you go in and ask a question, you know we have we have a dossier and uh, we want to know if it'll get registered. Uh, and you ask, would this qualify for VERV? Uh, the EPA said, well, you know, in our normal process, we do a quick review. There's there's two or three review processes as you move through the 12 months or 18 months or 24 months, and you're all familiar with that. But they can look at the dossier and kind of give you an idea, well, this may. Uh, they can't give you anything conclusive, no guarantees. So there is that part up front, but then as they go through, there could be things that uh, might uh, not make it uh, qualify. So that that's what we have to see when we get some uh, active ingredients and or products uh, through there. And uh, then the EPA, you know, they're going to have to get this uh, figured out too. So uh, we'll just have to see how that uh, works. 
I don't know, Jeff, do you have anything else? Um, I, there's one final question that I wanted to bring, and, and I'm mindful of time. Um, bring that forward. Um, so if this issue of exactly what might qualify um, for a verb um, has come up in the chat again. So um, do we mean that only interventions that can be used in insecticide treated nets or indoor residual sprays are will qualify for a verb? Um, or how will the EPA, for instance, determine that an active ingredient or product would ap apply in a different platform or product? So I would say that there's clear eligibility criteria in the law, but still some things that need to be worked out in EPA guidance because laws tend to be a little more general. So for example, when you look at that public health exception that the EPA can allow something to be repurposed, uh, if there's a significant public health benefit, that's an area that needs more um, criteria. The other thing is that the voucher criteria does say that you know the platforms that are can be used in primary um, insecticide intervention areas such as bed nets or indoor or residual sparing or that enhance IPM programs. Those are examples, uh, but they should not be considered limiting. If um, and we can put in the chat a link to the law itself, and that does say specific the specific eligibility criteria is outlined pretty, you know, in the law, you can follow all those bullet points and, and look at it for yourself as well. So we can put that in the chat. I, I guess the other comment I would make based on um, PRV experiences, I mean, it, it, it's not an inconsequential matter to to bring forward a product and say, we think that this meets the, the eligibility criteria. So having some conversations, having discussions, preliminary discussions with the agency is important. Now, they're not going to give you a definitive ruling until they've seen the full dossier and they've they've been able to fully evaluate it, but they're certainly going to give you a steer. They're certainly going to give you some encouragement to say, yes, this uh, preliminarily, this this looks like it, this is this is meeting the criteria. That's certainly been our experience with uh, PRV, and I would I, I have no reason to doubt that the EPA is going to have some similar process to, to preliminary guidance without a, a you know full endorsement until they've seen the full package. Thank you for that, um, Laurie and Jeff. Alan, did you want to add something? We're almost out of time, so quickly, please. Uh, not really. Uh, you know, Laurie uh, covered the two points that I wanted to make about uh, Section EE and the exception. Uh, so when you look at the verb provision, uh, she's kind of giving you the idea of what to look at and think about. So uh, I'll I'll let 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 that be. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Well, um, all that remains now is to close this session. First of all, I wanted to thank all our speakers today for their time and the insight that they've given into the Verve program. But most of all, we really appreciate um, all of you on this uh, webinar taking the time out of your schedule to learn more about the Verve and participating actively in the session and sharing your questions with us as well. Uh, a reminder that all registered participants will receive a recording of this session by email in the coming days and alongside that we'll send some resources as well to help you navigate the VERB program. Um, of course, you can also access more resources and information on VERB, um, and we encourage you to visit an independent hub of resources and information um, set up by uh, Dr. Mo and his colleagues, um, linked in which is the first link, uh, www.vectorvoucher.info. Um, but also on the IVCC website, you can also check regularly for updates and um, information on the Verve program um, within the link below. Um, we'll share, as I say, this presentation, so you'll be able to have access to those slides as well. Uh, to those links as well, apologies. Um, now, if you have any further questions or you'd like to discuss the VERV in any more detail with us, feel free to reach out to IVCC via email. You can contact us via our website and if you, or if you want any more information of any type. And with that, all that remains is for me to thank our speakers again and to thank you all for joining us.